Why would Matthew do more with Jesus' words while Mark does more with Jesus' works? Matthew develops these words and teachings of Jesus largely because I think he's trying to portray Jesus as a new Moses and the teachings of Moses in the Pentateuch. Pentateuch, five books. Genesis to Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. And so what happens is Matthew is modeling Jesus to these Jews. He's modeling them on Moses. And Moses is teaching in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to Deuteronomy. And so Mark, however, is writing to Roman audience. And so Mark does more with the works of Jesus. Jesus did this and Jesus did that. And it doesn't tell us so much about what Jesus taught. It tells us what he did, did, did. And some people, by the way, are focused more on teaching, and some people are more focused on works and what Jesus actually did. Mark, because of his audience, and I think he himself, went that direction. Now lastly, I think you've got to ask about the audience. The audience of Mark seems to be more Roman, so they're going to be more interested in action, being from Rome background. The Jewish people would be more interested in Jesus' teaching, as a kind of viewing Jesus as a great rabbi, the rabbinic teaching of the teacher. And so Matthew will develop then the teaching of Jesus, and actually we'll come back to this in a few minutes here, but Matthew will develop the teachings of Jesus around five discourses. Matthew's whole book will be built around these five discourses. And I, I'm suggesting to you, as others have suggested, and I'm just ripping it off, but to basically these five discourses that Matthew is built around is built to model this Jesus as a new Moses. And as Moses had five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Jesus now has five major teachings, discourses in the, in the book of Matthew. So I think there's reasons for these, uh, these movements. Now, Matthew is methodical. This is, this is actually kind of stunning, actually. Matthew actually condenses. Matthew, the book of Matthew is much, much larger than the book of Mark. So you'd expect everything in Mark to be encapsulated form. It would be very small and very uh, almost proverbially uh, like a kernel. The kernel would be in the book of Mark, and what Matthew will do is pop that kernel up, and so if you'll go from two or three verses to a whole chapter, you'd expect Matthew to pop that kernel up. And what you have here is that's not the case when it comes to Mark's and the works of Jesus. So, for example, we've got the demoniacs, the Gergesene demoniac. So Jesus comes to this guy, the guy's cutting himself, slasher, he's kind of a slasher person. He's uh, in the graveyard, nobody can contain him. Jesus walks up to him and says, hey, who are you, man? Who are you in, the, in this guy? And the guy says, well, there's legion, we're, because we're so many demons in this guy, or we're legion. And they beg Jesus, don't, you know, you know, don't cast this, you know, do anything bad to us and stuff. Why don't you cast this into those pigs over there? So Jesus casts the demon's legion into the pigs. The pigs run down into the Sea of Galilee and perish. And then this guy, uh, the demoniac of Gergesene, has to go back. He wants to go with Jesus. Jesus says, no, go back and tell the people what great things God has done for you. Wonderful story. There's songs about this story. Um, a crown of some group sings the story of the demoniac of Gergesene. It's a tremendous story because in one sense, all of us are, in one sense, demon-possessed until freed like Jesus by Jesus and stuff. So, but what's interesting here is that Mark tells the story of the demoniac at Gergesene and the casting of demons into pigs, and the story is 326 words long. 326 words. Matthew tells that same story, has two demoniac Gergesene uh, demoniacs, actually has two guys rather than one that Mark tells us about, and the story is only 134 words long. So Matthew takes the story of Mark, 300, over 300 words, and he condenses it down to about 100 words. So Matthew takes that story of Mark, rather than expanding the story, it's something Jesus did, the casting of demons out into the pigs. He collapses the story down to one-third of what it is in Mark. So you can see that Matthew takes the words of Jesus and blows them up, but he takes the works of Jesus and he boils them down. And so you've got the story is actually one-third of the size uh, that it is there. And here's the actual phrase, that we're, the uh, point that we're making uh, now in the PowerPoint. So 326 words in Mark, one demoniac, down to 134 words and two demoniacs in the book of Matthew. Mark focuses on the works of Jesus. Matthew focuses on the words of Jesus more. Now here's another one. Jesus walking on the water. 
Jesus walking in the water. Mark has a story of Jesus walking in the water. The story is 139 year words long. Matthew, Mark, I'm sorry, has Jesus walking in the water. He tells a story in about 139 words. Matthew, over in chapter 14, uh, just John the Baptist is going to be beheaded in this chapter. He's going to feed the 5,000. And Jesus then was walking on the water. And then, actually, Matthew tells us about Peter getting out of the boat and walking to Jesus, and then Peter falling in, Jesus bailing him out and things. But so, so Matthew adds this thing about Peter falling into the water and walking on the water and falling in and things, and Jesus pulling him out. But yet, even so, with the addition of Peter, the story in Matthew is 101 words. So it's like, you know, 40 words less. It's almost, what, one-third less, plus adding, it adds a story about Peter. So again, Matthew collapses the stories on the works of Jesus and, and shrinks them down. You would expect the story in Matthew to be much longer. Matthew is a much bigger book. And instead, the story's shorter, but he adds this story about Peter. Now the question is, why does he add that story about Peter? Okay, why does he put the story about Peter? And then Peter falls in as a result of his little faith. Okay, so interesting thing there. I think, let me just give you a hint. I think Peter is the consummate disciple. In the book of Matthew, I think Peter is portrayed as the consummate disciple. He, Peter is good, Peter is bad. He'll be portrayed both ways, in the, but he's this kind of representative. Peter is a representative of the disciple. He's his representative disciple. And so takes that role as kind of the special disciple there. Now, here's the book of Matthew, and I want to basically show how the book of Matthew focuses around these, what do we call, five discourses, or five sermons of Jesus. So Matthew as the new Moses and the new Pentateuch in one sense here. And so we've got Jesus' first big discourse is the Sermon on the Mount. Three chapters of Jesus' teachings, from the Beatitude to, you have heard it said of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, you have heard it said of old time, thou shalt not murder, but I say unto you, whoever is angry at his brother without a cause has committed murder already in his heart. Okay, And so Jesus goes, the Sermon on the Mount, Tremendous teaching, focal point of the summary of the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in those three chapters. Phenomenal sermon, Sermon on the Mount. Every Christian should be very, very well familiar with uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Secondly, uh, there's a discourse in chapter 10 where Jesus sends the 12. Remember from your picture scripture, sends 12. He sends the 12 out and he warns them that they're going to have a rough time when they go out there. And he sends them only to the house of Israel. Notice also the focus on Israel, Jewish audience possibly, focuses there. Go out to the, to the people of Israel and basically spread the gospel. So he sends out the twelve and he commissions them. And it's a very long chapter, chapter 10, Jesus instructing his disciples as they go out as his witnesses to spread the gospel uh, in that chapter, chapter 10. Chapter 13, very famous passage. Uh, we, in the picture scripture, we call it chapter 13, Seeds and Weeds. Seeds and weeds. And you remember, these are the great parables of Jesus. Matthew chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom. There's about seven or so parables there. Uh, you know, some seed falls uh, on, the, on the path and basically nothing happens. Some of it falls on the, the stony ground and it comes up for a bit, but there's no roots and things, so it dries up when the sun hits it and things. Some falls on the, the thorny ground and the thorny ground, it comes up and it looks like it's going to do real well, but the thorns and weeds choke it. And so it doesn't produce anything. And so then finally, some seed falls on the good ground and it comes up and produces, you know, 60, 100 and more. And uh, the kingdom of heaven is like that. And so actually people are always saying it's not the parable of the seeds or the sower, it's the parable of the soils, telling the different types of soils. And I, you know, I, I don't want to quibble over those kind of things, but, but basically it's telling you there's, there's different responses to the word of God and its effectiveness in people's lives. You got parable of the, of the wheat and tares, okay? The guy plants the tares and the, he plants the wheat and he's wanting the wheat to grow and all of a sudden they realize that an enemy came in and planted all these weeds in there and the weeds are growing up and it looks just like the wheat initially and he said, so the guys say, hey, to the master, shall we pull the weeds out? And the master says, no, leave the weeds grow with the wheat until the time of the harvest and at the time of the harvest then separate the tares from the wheat and burn them up. And it's kind of, you get this notion of burning up the tares, the tares are the bad folks, and the wheat is the good folks. So you get these seven parables uh, in the teaching of the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom, seeds and weeds. 
uh, great teachings on parables there. If you're ever interested in parables, that's a great place to start.